For those who are online, just letting you know, we're going to be starting here just in about two minutes. So we'll be getting folks brought in here who are here live. So looking forward to having you here. All right, we welcome everyone to the Chamberlain Holiness Lecture Series. This is an endowed uh, endowed um, lectureship that's been going on for multiple decades. We've had many people come through the years, participate in this. Sometimes it's taken the form of more of kind of like a preaching event, but in this function now, particularly since we've been in this facility, it's more of a lecture. So we're glad you're here and glad that the students are here. And just a little instruction of how this will work. Those of you who are normally in classes from six to nine on Monday and Tuesday nights, you're with us for this first hour and 15 minutes, and then you will go into your classes. So those things will be happening on a, just as we have announced before. We're glad to get this moving along. Also, I'd encourage folks to take a look at the um, in the chat for the Zoom room. If you find in that chat, you should find a PDF or a Word document for the outline for the lecture tonight. So you check that out. And we hope, too, that you'll engage this presentation after it is complete. Dr. Blakemore is going to offer an official response, and he's doing that on the fly for us because our first respondent wasn't able to come at the last minute. And the tomorrow, Austin Roberts Roberson, who I've just learned today, I was saying his name wrong. I've been saying his name wrong for a year. Nevertheless, he'll be responding tomorrow night. But we invite you to... Uh, to type out your question in the chat. Jeff and I will look at those and we'll see if we can offer those to Dr. McCall when the time comes. Let's pray as we get started. Jesus, we are thankful that you are present with us as you have promised to always be with us. 
Thank you for the opportunity that we'll have tonight to learn from Dr. McCall. We pray that you use his presentation for our life and for the good of the church. We say all this to the glory of our triune God and in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are honored to have with us Dr. Tom McCall as our guest for the Chamberlain Lectureship. This is unique for us in that we are able to bring in an alumnus of our school. So Dr. McCall graduated from Wesley Biblical Seminary in 1996, and he went on to complete a PhD from Calvin Theological Seminary. And I think the best way, before I start to list all of his accomplishments, um, and well, I'll just say a few of them, he was awarded a Templeton Prize while he was at the, at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, started a program there, the Carl Henry School for Theological Understanding. In addition to now serving in the first endowed chair the, uh, of systematic theology at Asbury Theological Seminary, the Tim and Julie Tennant chair there. He's written multiple books. I'm just going to name a few of them for you, and I'm excited about some of the ones that are coming out as well. Um, his book, Against God and Nature, The Doctrine of Sin, an Invitation to Analytic Christian Theology, Two Views on the Doctrine of the Trinity, Forsaken, the Trinity and the Cross and Why it Matters, Jacob Arminius, Theologian of Grace, Which Trinity, Whose Monotheism, Philosophical and Systematic Theologians on the Metaphysics of Trinitarian Theology. And all these books are published by major academic publishers. And we have often been incredibly proud to associate ourselves with Dr. McCall here. And I, th I think of this like when I was in seminary, my first year, I had a professor tell me there was a guest lectureship happening to that year. And I didn't quite know that I, the names of the people who are involved, but a New Testament professor said, well, you really need to make sure to attend this lectureship. It was, and it was Gordon Fee who was presenting. It's like, you really need to attend. So I went and I did my best to follow along his presentation. Actually, I remember being in the room and I was one of the only students in the room is mainly just in the theological faculty there. And I was hanging on for dear life intellectually, but I could say I was one of the 15 people in the room when Gordon Fee was presenting. And then a couple of months later, after my philosophy class, they told me that Alvin Plantinga was gonna be presenting as well. And again, I was just getting used to the literature, Dr. Blake Moore, so please forgive me. Like, I'm like, okay. I've seen his name once or twice. Well, I think now in 20 years since that time, I've interacted with those names on a regular basis. Alvin Plantinga, Gordon Fee, and I, I'll, I'll think, I, I saw those guys. I was there. And I'm telling you, you may not believe this, but I'm telling you it's going to be true. You're going to be seeing Dr. McCall's name for the rest of your ministry. And he's somebody who's already been referenced. He's, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at how many other people, philosophers, theologians, um, cite him on a regular basis. His book on sin was incredibly helpful to me in my own preaching. So I encourage you to take that, take this opportunity where your theological faculty students, we are saying to you, this is somebody you should be reading. This is somebody you should be listening to. And we think for the rest of your ministry, his scholarship can feed you. And we're encouraging you, not just through this lectureship, but to look into the types of things Dr. McCall is doing and see how it's going to continue to impact the life of the church and your own ministry. So we're thrilled. The faculty voted on who they're going to have come and present. And it was the unanimous number one pick, first round draft pick, to have Dr. McCall come to present this lectureship. And we've got it set up for the next few years, but they certainly wanted him to come. Not only that, he's ordained in the Wesleyan Church. He serves at his local church in of uh, volunteer capacities. Um, he's somebody who's passionate about the church and his own children, his four kids, um, who are active in all kinds of ways, several of them attend Asbury University. And we are thrilled to have him here the next two nights. So tomorrow night, he'll be here also at 6 uh, p.m. <laughs> at 10. So Dr. McCall, at this point, we'd just love to welcome you here. And let's give Dr. McCall a hand. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Miller. I am old enough to remember a vice presidential debate where I think it was maybe Lloyd Benson who said to Dan Quayle, 
uh, I knew John Kennedy, sir, and you were no John F. Kennedy. <laughs> well, I can say I knew Gordon Fee and Alvin Plantinga, and I am no <laughs> Gordon Fee or Alvin Plantinga. Uh, goodness, no. But it is good to be with you, and um, I'm honored to, to be here. I was thinking about the, the people I know of who have delivered this lectureship series and it's um, humbling and a bit intimidating to think of that. I was here as a student in 1994 when Dr. John Oswalt gave the Chamber on Holiness Lectures, which turned into the book called To Be Holy, which I have assigned many, many times to students over the years and recommended to many, many more. So thank you for, for having me here. I do appreciate this. So my goal this evening and for the next couple of sessions is to explore some Wesleyan contributions to political theology. It, some people have asked, what, wait, what are you doing and why? So it's fair to you to say something about that as I begin. I've been interested for most of the work I've done over the years in the great, what I think of as sort of the great Christian doctrines of the, of the Christian faith, the doctrine of the triune God, doctrine of, of theological anthropology, doctrines of sin, the doctrine of Christ, doctrine of salvation. These, these are the, the, the great Christian doctrines of the faith that have really uh, interested me in, in, and commanded my attention. And those are the things when I, the publications I've done, those are the things I've worked on. I have also been interested in um, Christian ethics and the life of the church in the world. And I have taught um, theological ethics and moral theology off and on over the years. I haven't done anything publications-wise, but I have been interested in those issues for a long time. What I'm wanting to do is put those two sets of interests together. And so I want to, to wanting us and help us think about Wesleyan contributions to political theology. What I'm not trying to do is an exercise in historical theology or church history. I'm not talking about, say, John Wesley's own political theory or 19th century Methodist politics or anything of the nature. Um, Dr. Ryan Danker gave ample background to some of that last year. Uh, some of you obviously heard that. Those of you haven't, I encourage you to, to find those in the archives and watch those lectures. I'm also not offering a full-blown or anything approaching a full-blown Christian political theory. That's just way above my pay grade. Indeed, I'm not even offer, trying to offer a comprehensive Wesleyan political theology. And I'm certainly not going to be making a bunch of claims about distinct public policies. Those things are above my pay grade and beyond re my remit. What I am trying to do is look at some distinctly Wesleyan theological emphases. And I'm asking how these should inform our political theology. When I say distinctly Wesleyan theological emphases, I don't mean to suggest that these are uniquely Wesleyan. Thankfully, they're not. Thankfully, brothers and sisters in the Christian faith of all sorts of traditions also believe in, in many of the things we're talking about. But I do think that sometimes there are aspects that are uniquely Wesleyan, and there are emphases which are distinctly Wesleyan. And so I want us to think together about some of those I've used the term political theology a couple of times, and I think it's fair to you to at least give an indication of what I mean by the term. And so let me just say, uh, following Luke Bretherton and others, this is just basically theological reflection on politics, theological reflection on political life. What is political about political theology? I'm using politics here in the broad sense. This is life together common life, considerations of what count as good, happy, meaningful, just common life together. I'm not talking about red state, blue state divides. I'm talking about our, the broader issues of our life together. I, this, I've been unable to track down the source of this. I heard it uh, on an audio tape back when those things were out there many years ago. I think it may have been from his Chamberlain Holiness Lectures. But Tom Oden once said, Jesus prayed that we will be 
<clears throat> excuse me, Jesus prayed that we will be in the world, but not of the world. And he said, I'm afraid that far too often we are of the world, sometimes without ever being profoundly in the world at all. In other words, we can try to isolate ourselves and yet share the same value structure, the same basic assumptions of what counts as good or just or meaningful or flourishing. So political theology then is, in this sense, just the theological reflection on common life, considerations of what counts, what should count theologically as goodness, as true flourishing, as a meaningful life together in, in distinctly though now in light of who God is and in light of how God has acted in the world and in light of whom God has made us to be and called us to be. So that's the political part. Well, what's theological about political theology? For Christians, theology is and should be a response to God's gracious self-revelation, reliably in the written word, and ultimately in the living and incarnate word, Jesus Christ. For Wesleyan Christians, this is, or at least I think should be, theology that's creedally orthodox, thus Trinitarian, distinctly Protestant, and thus committed to sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, and evangelical. And I know that word has been itself very much politicized in recent years, so let me try to be clear about what I mean by that. Committed to the centrality of Scripture, the ultimacy of God's work in the incarnate, crucified, and resurrected Son, the vitality and importance of conversion, new birth, and sanctification, and mission through sharing the good news and through doing good works. If that sounds familiar to you, that's my restatement of David Bebbington's famous Wesley, or uh, sorry, David Bebbington's famous evangelical quadrilateral. Now, what I want to do to, in our time together is to offer some theses for reflection and scholastic disputation. This, by the way, is an old time honored um, and frankly, really cool way of doing theology. This is the way most, uh, or at least a great deal of scholastic theology was actually done. It was especially in areas that were still developing. Statements were made, theses were put forward, defended and re defended, and um, debated. And so I offer these this today. These are I do not offer these as a final word. You know better than that. I just want you to know that I know better than that too. These are things for us to reflect upon and hopefully to spur us on to good life, good deeds. So some theses for reflection and scholastic disputation. One, belief in the utter simple goodness of God is absolute bedrock for Wesleyan theology. God's nature is the holy love shared between Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, this one I am going to say is just flat out true. We can debate it if you want, but it's, it's there. I take it we don't need to say a lot more about this in this context. This or something like this has been a core thesis of theology in this institution for decades. But I do want to underscore it. And I want us to be sure that we understand that this means, thank you, that God is not merely good or contingently good. God is necessarily good. God is utterly good. God is perfectly good. The historic Christian doctrine of divine simplicity, which has been affirmed from the earliest Christian theologians up through the major Methodist theologians of the 19th century. It's our tradition, it's our heritage as Christians and distinctly as Wesleyans. This doctrine tells us in the strongest terms possible that God is not only good, but indeed, in some sense, is goodness. That is, the holy love of the triune God is not accidental to God's nature. It is his life. Two, God's necessary, perfect, and simple goodness is rightly understood as holy love. And it's helpful for us to distinguish and clarify what is meant by holiness and what is meant by love. 
Although the doctrine, the aforementioned doctrine of divine simplicity teaches us that holiness and love aren't like parts or pieces of God. Thus, of course, they're not parts in competition or intention, even potentially or possibly. Nonetheless, it's helpful for us on this side of the way God's um, graciously revealed himself and his ways. It's helpful for us to consider these distinctly. And we need to remember as we do so that God's love is always and necessarily a holy love. And his holiness is always and necessarily and essentially loving holiness. Three, more precisely, God's holiness can be understood as God's absolute otherness or transcendence and as God's simple, unblemished purity. These are the two aspects that stand out when we think about divine holiness. The first of these we see from phenomenologists of religion and philosophers of religion. They have long observed that holiness is at once both somehow compelling and attractive, and yet also in a different sense, something that, that frightens or repels us. This is what Rudolf Otto famously referred to as the mysterium tremendum et fascinans. That is that, that mysterious element that both attracts us and also worries us. Biblical theologians have been immensely helpful here. The phenomena of religion are helpful to some degree, but they can only take us so far. And I think the biblical theologians have been immensely helpful here. They have helped us see that holiness is revealed as distinctly covenantal. As I said, I was here when John Oswald gave those wonderful lectures in 1994. And this was one of the main themes that came through again and again and again, is that God reveals God's own being and nature and character as holy, and that God does so not just by announcing this, but God does so by making or cutting a covenant. That's the revelation of holiness. So on one hand, holiness points us towards God's unfathomable otherness and transcendence. God is wholly other cannot be adequately understood in merely human categories or reduced to being one more thing among other things, just a, a bigger version of one of us. On the other hand, though, God's holiness is not mere strangeness or difference. It is complete, uncompromised moral purity, or something close to moral purity, if you're a philosopher who worries that that might not be the best term in the technical sense. We'll use it for our purposes now, and we can debate that later. And indeed, these themes come together. God is not only other or transcendent because he's infinite and we're finite. God is also other and transcendent because God is perfectly pure and holy and we are not. Four, in relation to creatures, God's holiness is expressed and experienced as justice and righteousness as well as truth and faithfulness. Again, recall the covenantal context. God doesn't merely announce his holiness. God reveals it in covenant. Isaiah says in 5.16 that Yahweh shows himself holy by his righteousness. As the Methodist theologian William Burt Pope says, God's nature is the sum and standard of all goodness and is eternally opposed to all that is not good in the creature. The psalmist says in Psalm 99, he is a mighty king who is a lover of justice and goes on to specify that God is a mighty king and a lover of justice because God is holy. The law and the prophets together remind us again and again that he always shows no favoritism in the words of language of Deuteronomy 10, takes no bribes, doesn't lift up faces in showing favoritism but instead executes judgment for the orphan and the widow, the God who loves strangers. There's no perversion of justice with Yahweh, our God. There's no partiality. There's no taking bribes. Hebrews echoes this term, this theme, God is not unjust, we read in Hebrews 6. God is the rock. His ways are perfect. All his work is just. A faithful God without deceit who is just and upright, that is Yahweh, according to 
God's revelation in Deuteronomy 32. So to this point, these may sound like mere pious platitudes that have that seem to be still yet a long way um, from any kind of political theology. But it's that God's nature is utter, complete, simple goodness. He is light, and in him is no darkness at all. It's that we understand God's nature in light of his covenantal revelation as holiness and love. That this holiness is then to be understood in terms of otherness and transcendence on the one hand and purity on the other. And in relation to creatures, this holiness is experienced by us as justice and righteousness as well as truth and faithfulness. Five, God's love can be understood as desire for the good or flourishing of the beloved, desire for union with the beloved, and delight in the goodness of the beloved. And this love extends even to God's own enemies. Some of you will note here that I'm drawing heavily from major medieval accounts of divine love. These three elements. A desire for the flourishing of the beloved. A desire for union with the beloved. And a delight in the goodness of the beloved. When we know that God is love, we know that this is not just sentiment, not just a sentimental phrase. It's desire for the good, desire for union and delight. And we know that this love extends even to God's own enemies. This is God's desire for the good or flourishing, God's desire for the proper kind of union, and God's delight. I think of Ezekiel 33, where on at the conclusion of these dire warnings, unmistakable pronouncements of judgment, God says, as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Did you hear those words? As I live. God's own character, God's own nature, God's own essence, God's own existence is tied to his goodness expressed as love for those who rebel against him as his enemies. As I live. In relation to creatures, six, God's love is expressed and experienced as wrath and mercy. Now, in creatures, of course, love and wrath are easily misunderstood. They're easily understood to be opposed. But within the simple life of the triune God, love and wrath are not inconsistent or even in tension. As C.S. Lewis once observed, indifference is not consistent with love. But the doctrine of the wrath of God tells us that God is anything but indifferent about us and our sin. And the doctrine of the wrath of God tells us that the whole world is under the wrath of God. That is, that God is not indifferent about anything in the world or any of his creatures. My friend Stephen T. Davis has this great line. My only hope, he says, is the wrath of God. Because his wrath is not opposed to his love. And God's love, God's the holy love of God, is experienced by creatures as wrath and as mercy. Seven, divine economy is always perfectly consistent with divine ontology. That is, all that God does in creation and providence and redemption is for the purpose of sharing that love. A.W. Tozer put it close to this once when he says, all that God is does all that God does. Or, to quote John of Damascus, God alone is good and wise by nature. Since God is good, God creates, and since God is good, God provides. That is, the creation is not a vast cosmic experiment. God does not establish a world and then determine all things to occur. 
just as they do, so that some creatures made of the divine image will be predestined for eternal joy and glory, while others are predetermined for damnation from before the foundation of the world. No, all that God does is an expression and communication of goodness. This is just bedrock Christian faith that runs from the early church through the high Middle Ages, well into the Reformation period, and somehow has sadly, in some quarters, been lost since. Eight, the Christian doctrine of original sin warns us that power is easily corrupted, and it cautions us about easy self-trust. So the first these are directed toward God and much more fun to think about. But the sober truth, the sobering truth, is that creatures made in God's image, made for that holy love, have turned away from it. And what we learn from Scripture and Christian theology in light of God's revelation is that sin is both personal and systemic. That is, both individual persons and whole societies are corrupted by evil. We should be alert, then, to the dangers of power that's concentrated. And I'll have more to say about this in application, but let me, at this point, just say, whether it's big business or big government or big whatever, power that's concentrated is something that Christians should be, about which Christians should be concerned because of Christian commitments. In other words, it's not in spite of our Christian commitments, it's because of our Christian commitments that we should be concerned about these things. But the, the great Christian doctrine of original sin also, I think, warns us about easy self-trust. And we should be especially concerned, I think, with this all-too-common slippage into assuming that our side is pure and righteous, while those other people are always evil and utterly malevolent. Indeed, I think there's a good argument to be made that we should be open to the insights of and perhaps even grateful for the insights of non-Christian and even anti-Christian analyses of how evil spreads and corrupts. Merrill Westfall has a book named entitled Suspicion and Faith, where he recommends reading Nietzsche and Marx for Lent. Not because they have any solution to offer, but because they offer a penetrating diagnosis of the human condition. Now, since you mentioned Alvin Plantinga earlier, I'll say he, he responds that we shouldn't need that. If we read the prophets, we see the same thing. Fair enough, but we can appreciate it where they're correct too. And various forms of critical theory may actually have something to instruct us in this way without for a moment looking to such theories for a solution to the human condition. We can certainly look to them and see it sometimes an all too accurate an utterly depressing account of the way human life works out. Thus again, thesis eight, the Christian doctrine of original sin warns us that power is easily corrupted and it cautions us about easy self-trust. Nine, back to good news. The gospel tells us that despite the extent and depth of our depravity, God's redeemed people are called and commanded and cleansed in order that they might receive and share God's holy love and that they might live in ways that exemplify and extend that love. Yes, it happens in ways that are less than complete. Yes, Paul tells us that those who have not yet reached press on to the goal. Yes, we know that that's where we're at as well. And yet we also know that this is for what we were made. This is the destiny for which we are redeemed. And this is the destiny we live unto at this point. To receive, but also to share. To, to receive, but also to give this great gift. We're made to know that goodness made to share in the communion of holy love, made to enjoy God. Thus, 
for classical Christian theology, creation is an expression of God's goodness, and so are all acts of providence and redemption. We are created to receive and extend this love. We are called and then commanded to love God with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength, and with that, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And then we are cleansed, that is, sanctified, so that this can be and become a reality. To be saved, to belong to God, is to walk with God, to be transformed by God, to come to share more and more God's own character. And this is the call and the invitation and indeed the command of our Lord Jesus himself when he's asked the first and greatest grasp of the first and greatest commandment. You all know this. You know how he's asked one question, but responds with two answers. He's not asked to rank the questions. He's not asked which is the first, and then I'll go ahead and tell us which is the second. He's only asked what, which is the first. He answers that as of course he should, but he refuses to uncouple that question from the one that should follow. We are all too often okay with loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and uncoupling that from the next part. Jesus will not let us split our world that way. Jesus is the one who says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. 10, to be a holy people is to be a people committed to human good and human flourishing. And this commitment extends to all people, including our neighbors and even our enemies. To be God's people and thus to share God's character is to love all. That's to the extent, of course, in ways which we are able as finite creatures to do so. None of us can love the entire world equally or the same way. Nonetheless, to be God's people and thus to share God's character is to love. And if we're asking the question of how little do I have to love for this to count, Jesus tells us we're asking the wrong question. The parable that we call the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10 gives us a direct response to this question. Who is my neighbor? And the answer we receive there tells us that the the, the, the proper response to this question is one that points toward those who are not like us, to those whom we, find, we may even find disgusting or foreign or strange or frightening, to those frightened of us or who find us disgusting. This extends to situations where we are inconvenienced as in Luke 10. This extends to those situations wherein we might find ourselves in danger, again, in Luke 10. Now, of course, and I say of course because you all know this, I want you to know that I know this. Of course, there will be disagreements among Christians about the best ways to promote human flourishing. There will be questions about public policy. How much governmental oversight how much government control is helpful? How much is onerous? How much is burdensome? How much of these decisions should be left to private citizens or various volunteer-based groups, etc.? There will be questions about how this is implemented. Fair enough. And when it comes to complex issues of economics and social structures, the answers are often less than completely clear-cut. And thus, we actually need to consider and debate these together. But how, and more fundamentally, why do we need to have these discussions and debates about which ways are most advantageous? To score points? To advance the agenda of some, some particular group? To beat someone down and declare victory? To mock the red state bumpkins or own the libs? My point is that we can, and indeed should, have rigorous discussion 
we should welcome the debates among ourselves about the best ways to achieve or maximize human flourishing. We should have those. But they must be done for the good of our neighbors and even our enemies. If God's nature is holy love, and if love means to desire for the flourishing of the beloved, then I don't see any way around this. I don't see how this is an option for Christians. For those who come to share God's own character, those who come to extend God's love, love for our neighbors, including those who seem foreign or strange or weird or repulsive, is just part of what it means to belong to God. Now, we, again, will have and, and will inevitably and should have vigorous discussions and perhaps debates about these things among ourselves. What is the best way to achieve, right? What's the best way to promote this? Let that happen. But let that happen under the shared commitment that whatever that turns out to be, that's what we're about. We must struggle to find the best ways to promote human flourishing, but we can never be apathetic about it. And certainly, brothers and sisters, we should never be opposed to it. 11. To be a holy people is to be a people committed to justice and righteousness for all. Again, we might debate various definitions of justice. We might disagree about various prudential matters about how to achieve or apply justice in various situations. Uh, some of you may think injustice largely along the lines of, say, Nicholas Walterstorff's view of justice. Others of you may take a more broadly Rawlsian account after John Rawls of justice as fairness. We might think that his notion of considering oneself behind the so-called veil of ignorance, that is, trying to think of a society where you would be content no matter what your role in it. So you're behind the veil. You don't know which role you would play in the society, but you do want a society that's structured in such a way that no matter which role you play, wherever you're placed in it, you would not think it's unjust. Now, some people look at this as um, radically unchristian. Other people are tempted to think of it as a secular counterpart to Jesus' golden rule, and thus compatible with Christian ethics, if not an expression of it. We might argue about retributive justice or distributive justice. That is what all that is to say we may disagree among ourselves about these matters. But even though we might disagree, and even though we might need to even debate our way through our differences, the end goal should never be in doubt. Do you see that? The debate should take place under the shared commitment that we are passionate about justice for people. 12. To be a holy people is to be a people committed to utter truthfulness and fidelity. Again, if God's holiness includes and entails God's utter truthfulness and complete faithfulness. So if we come to share God's character, we will as well be committed to truthfulness and fidelity. Now, this may sound like a, a mere cliche. It's easy to hear what I just said and be like, oh, of course we're committed to telling the truth. But I can't shake this unsettling sense of how easy it is for hoaxes and conspiracy theories to take root and grow and spread in distinctly Christian circles. How easy is it sometimes to believe something, no matter how unsupported, no matter how it proceeds without substantial evidence, how easy it is to believe that thing so long as it supports or confirms what we already want to believe. Social psychologists and sociologists, Christian and otherwise, spot something and label something and identify something sometimes referred to as uh, confirmation bias or bias confirmation. We see what we want to see. We hear what we want to hear. We, we hear a particular account of something and because it fits our preferred outcome, we gravitate to it and often spread it. 
Think of how easy it is to shade the truth or trim the truth to score easy points. Of how easy the commitment to the truth gets lost in contemporary political discourse. Maybe we should say it the other way around. Think how hard it is to hear the truth in some context. Think of how common it is and how easy it is to tell part of the truth. I once had a friend say, always tell the truth and always tell nothing but the truth, but never, never, never tell the whole truth. <laughs> Think how easy that is of, to avoid the parts of the truth or the truths that are inconvenient for us while saying things that are true to gain some sort of advantage over people we deem to be political opponents. Think of how natural it is to take other people's statements out of context or describe someone's position in a way that the advocate of that view would not recognize. Think of how often this happens. And in contemporary political discourse, I think you'll soon be searching for examples of where this isn't the norm. And brothers and sisters, there is a biblical term for this behavior. It's called bearing false witness. Thirteen, to be a holy people is to be a people who desire and are committed to the proper relation of union with others. That is, we are to be reconciled people who are committed to the ministry of reconciliation. I'll have much more to say about this tomorrow evening, Lord willing. But at this point, I'm just reminding us that blasting someone or owning someone or destroying someone or belittling someone is not the calling of those who follow Jesus and are filled with the Spirit. We'll look at this in more detail tomorrow evening, Lord willing, but Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that those who have received this glorious reconciliation with God are now called to be ministers of reconciliation and thus, in his terms, can no longer see others the way we did before. Fourteen, to be a holy people is to be a people who delight in the flourishing of all of those creatures made in God's image. That is, not only should we seek the flourishing of our neighbors, but we should also delight in it. Now think about in our toxic, toxic, especially toxic North American culture. Think about what a powerful witness, Christian witness, this would be. If rather than mocking those who have our enemies, Rather than sneering at them, rather than belittling them at every point possible? What if they knew that we actually cared for them? What if deep down they it was undeniable to them that we want what is best for them? And 15, to be a holy people is to be a people whose ultimate and compelling allegiance is to God and God alone. The confession that Jesus is Lord is a statement with profound political consequences. That is, if Jesus is Lord, there can be no rivals to him. Now, I know that we often say this, and, and I'm sure we mean it, but it's so easy to privatize this. Jesus is Lord means I'll surrender to him and I'll become a pastor instead of a lawyer. Or something like that. By the way, good thing to do, people on you know, students, students online, right? It's a good thing to do, but it's so easy to privatize this. And make no mistake, the personal aspect is immensely important. But the implications are broader than our personal affections and intentions. If Jesus is Lord, then no political party or affiliation can command our allegiance in that way. If Jesus is Lord, then no national identity can be a rival to our identity in Christ. 
If Jesus is Lord, then no nation state or political ideology can be a rival to Christ. If Jesus is Lord, then our ultimate allegiance is not to the U.S. Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Those are not an inspired word of God. If Jesus is Lord, it's nothing less than idolatry to conflate or confuse our Christian faith with national identity or political affiliation. And if we struggle to tell the difference between our national identity and our Christianity, or if we have a hard time actually distinguishing between our party flat platform and our Christian discipleship, that itself should be a huge neon sign and a loud klaxon siren warning us of, our, of idolatry. Let me be more concrete. If the policies of a nation state conflict with the values of Christ, then our allegiance must always be to Christ. If the platform or actions of a political party effectively undercut or deny the life of discipleship, then we must denounce that platform and the actions of that party, even if we think that one isn't as bad overall as the other one. Allegiance to the Lordship of Christ, simply put, means there can be no rivals. To be a holy people, I think, will very likely put us in uncomfortable positions in relation to the regnant political ideologies of our day. We're going to be different. To be a holy people, to share the mind of Christ, and thus come to share the affections and passions of our Lord, is to care for the poor and the oppressed. And, as I was just reminded of from reflecting on the story of Jesus' ministry to Zacchaeus, is also to care for the oppressor. To be a holy people is to care for the alien and the stranger, for the disabled and the neurodiverse, and indeed all who are seen by our world as unworthy or weird or strange or threatening. To be a holy people is to be for the most vulnerable humans, whether they be in the womb or at the border or at the store down the street. Jesus is Lord and will have no rivals. Now, a couple of reflections and questions in closing. I hope that I'm wrong in what I'm getting ready to say. But here's what I think I see, at least in the U.S. context. In all too many instances, we see either, on the one hand, compromised entanglement with certain parties, or just complete disengagement. And I don't think that either option is adequate for followers of Jesus. I understand, and indeed, I, I'll confess that I do feel the pull myself of those who are so utterly disgusted by the current situation, that they just want to withdraw entirely from, from any sort of public life or, or any, even in the broad sense of which I'm referring to it as political life. But we're called to be salt and light in our world. And to simply pull back into our own private lives seems to me like nothing more than the selfish luxury of privilege. But compromised entanglement is no way forward either. And the Old Testament prophets make this unmistakably and very uncomfortably clear. Idolatry produces injustice. They go together again and again and again. So let me leave us with a couple of questions for reflection. First, if what I've said about holy love is correct or anywhere close to correct, how do these commitments relate to implications for Christians in politics? A bit more precisely, how do these commitments to holy love impact our presence on social media? How do these commitments impact our position on the culture wars? How do we, for instance, among many other things, as people committed to holy love, act in school board meetings? Secondly, how should we think about the role of the church as such, the ecclesia, at the end of liberalism? C, 
Thirdly, do we have the courage to live in ways that truly reflect our vocation as people of holy love with our limitations, with our faltering, staggering steps? In all of our weakness, and indeed, in some cases, in our sins, will we follow Jesus and be faithful to him as Lord in all of life? Or are we so afraid of being dismissed that we're unwilling to speak out and stand up? Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about talking all the time about the same issues in every context. That can be both bad for us and counterproductive in our efforts. But are we ever willing to speak the truth in love? Or are we so intimidated by the thought of being canceled or whatever that we will never, for instance, speak up or stand up for the unborn? Or alternatively, are we so afraid of being labeled woke, we refuse to speak up or stand out on any issues of race or ethnicity? So far as I can say, neither isolation and withdrawal on the one hand or allowing for competing allegiances to anything else is the way forward. And I want to say, this is not a time for either triumphalism or despair. Against the triumphalism, I'm reminded of the first few chapters of Isaiah and how Isaiah begins, the book of Isaiah begins with Isaiah preaching up and down the land. And there's a characteristic refrain you all know. Woe to you, and woe to you, and woe to you, and woe to you. Isaiah's really sure of everyone else's problems. But in Isaiah 6, when he encounters the Lord, the first thing out of his mouth is, woe is me. And as you recall, he confesses not only his own personal shortcomings and sins, but he also says, I live among a people who share the sin. This is not a time for triumphalism, but nor is it a time for despair. Why? Not because we're great, not because we're awesome, not because we've got all the answers to all the hard problems but because of the goodness and greatness of God and that God, in spite of us, works through and uses flawed and broken sinners whom he is transforming into his own image. And that's true for us in our personal lives, and it should inform us, I'm convinced, with respect to our public witness as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCall. And I'll just encourage our students to hang in there for the next few minutes um, as we engage this lecture. And I invite Dr. Blakemore to come forward and offer a first response. And please, if you have a question or if you'd like to see how this is fleshed out a little bit more to direct to Dr. McCall, just go ahead and write that in the chat. That would be great. And just a reminder, we, we still have plenty of time here, about 20 minutes before we, as if we are all here together, all 100 of us just went off to our classrooms electronically. We'll get there, but just hang in here. We'd love to see, for you to be able to participate in this portion of the lecture. Well, I'm happy um, to have been in the dugout and called to get on deck and then be the pinch hitter. Um, my father once told somebody about me, he said he has opinions about everything, even stuff he's never heard of. And so I often tell people when they ask me what I think about something, I say, I don't know. Let me start talking and we'll both find out at the same time. But it is a, it is a real honor to be able to uh, resp rep respond to um, this thought-provoking and challenging presentation by my friend, Dr. Tom McCall, I've been blessed to know him uh, in increasing close ways over the last 20 years or so. And I have rejoiced in the stature that he has achieved in the evangelical world as a Wesleyan theologian. As I listen to him to, tonight, 
in my view, the presentation broke down into uh, two ways. First of all, we, he gave us an ontology. What's the ontological foundation for how we would think about anything social, political, personal, etc.? So that's the essence, nature of God. And then much of the last part, he was laying out for us what we might call the virtues of Christian citizenship. How is it that Christians should engage in living in a culture? And I find what he said to be uh, on target. He admitted and indicated, indeed, that when it comes to fleshing this out, the devil is in the details, or if we want to be more positive, the holiness is in the details. What would all of this look like when you begin to try to apply it? So let me just offer some of my thoughts in response to a couple of things that were said tonight. First of all, in terms of being committed to justice, we need to be very careful in the culture we live in today when we even use the word justice because it is so misused. As a matter of fact, justice now means being unjust to those who have been the beneficiaries of certain cultural things, certain cultural principles, certain cultural processes. So to be anti-racist, for instance, doesn't mean to seek equality of opportunity and treatment for all people, but it means to be definitively and objectively and, in, and intentionally oppressive to those who have enjoyed positions of uh, so-called privilege. If you look at the way the Old Testament actually defines justice or describes it or utilizes it, we find that for the people of Israel, justice had nothing to do with being uncritically, unreflectively kind or concerned about the poor or about the oppressed. It certainly does entail being concerned about and uh, in favor of the poor and the oppressed receiving fair treatment under the covenant. But you, look as, you can look at the 23rd chapter of the book of Exodus or Deuteronomy 1 or Leviticus 19, and you'll hear these staggering words. It says, do not show any privilege or favoritism toward a poor man when he's involved in a lawsuit. But also, don't discriminate against the poor. Don't treat him differently because he's poor and weak and has, has no one to, to contend for him. So what's the whole point there? The justice of God lived out in human culture has to be something in which there is some sort of covenant. And in the United States of America, historically, the founders of the nation saw that as a constitution that had divisions of powers that did enumerate um, rights that citizens, all citizens should have over against an all-powerful government so that there would be fairness, so that there would be the potentiality for equality. However, as with all things, even the beauty of a, of a constitution and a bill of rights with divisions of powers and all of that can go awry, and it has gone awry. And as we have wandered further and further away from a constitutional form of government, we have found again and again that oppression and injustice and inequality have actually increased in the name of progress. I think I could demonstrate that as a matter of historical fact if I needed to and had the time. So, I do not disagree with any of it. I just want to say when it comes to this sort of reasoning, we have to understand that to live as people of justice in a prudential and provisional manner in a finite world that God has created, there really are um, structures that are required. And in a constitutional republic such as ours, adherence to the values of a constitution is something that Christians should be really committed to as Christians, as a prudential matter, not as an ultimate matter, but as a prudential matter of how do we live this out. Second thing is I want to just echo 
and applaud uh, Dr. McCall for pointing out that one of the most insidious factors about original sin is not that it makes us wicked and evil through and through, but it makes us incredibly prone to self-deception. We can be we can deceive ourselves so easily, right? How many times have people said this sort of thing? Well, I know this is wrong, but in my case, it's different. Original sin can make us quite self-deceived. And so we owe it to ourselves to hold each other accountable to not deceiving ourselves because when you live in a world of confusion, when you live in a world in which finally for the first time, I've begun to believe that there could be a, a world dominating antichrist and a false prophet with all the social media uh, that exists. When, when people are fed constantly by narratives and false information, we owe it to ourselves to say to one another, let's, let's tap the brakes on what we think we know. Let's tap the brakes on what we think is right. Let's tap not about the gospel, but about the details and the facts, as people call it, or the narrative, as people prefer it now. Um, final thing I would say is this, is that to be, um, to be unwilling to, um, to, to be willing to tell the truth about things requires a level of intellectual engagement that most people are too lazy to engage in. So when we think about what we could learn, for instance, from things like critical theory in all of its various manifestations, it requires a pretty heavy lift to go back and look at all of the factors that go into people's evaluations of what's wrong with our culture presently. And to be able to say whatever is wrong in our culture presently is not a unique evil to the United States of America or to Western civilization. It is the manifestation of human sinfulness that has been true since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, to engage, therefore, in prudential reasoning requires us to engage in critical analysis, which, regard, which requires us to learn some things about history and to be able to use our powers of, of rational discourse and social discourse really to begin to engage people in an honest, open dialogue, even when they're shouting back at us, even when they want us to shut up. However, it does require us to refuse to be canceled. It requires us to refuse to shut up. It requires us not simply to scream back at them, but it requires us to challenge the things that people think are right, when indeed those very things may be more destructive to human existence than the current ills that they are seeking to cure. So I don't have disagreements with my friend tonight, but I do have the observation that it gets tricky, it gets complex, and it gets really tiring when you get into the details. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Blakemore. Uh, those of you who who may have tuned in a bit late, you need to understand that that was a uh, act of super irrigation on his part, where he he stepped up at the last, early at the last minute here, and and offered that response. So we're grateful for that. Yes, as I said, um, there 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 should be, uh, there will be, and there should be. I think I wish we had more of, not less of intramural Christian discussions and debates over the best ways to pursue justice and righteousness and, and shalom and human flourishing in our world. We need more of that, not less, precisely because some of the, the details are going to be have to work out prudentially and in, and in conversation. Uh, I'm just going to guess most of us don't have enough of on our own. I don't. Um, what I want to do as a theologian is to say we should be having those, be, and we should be having those because of these commitments. 
these commitments should not be negotiable. And the, the commitments that, that I've talked about, the moral and theological commitments, I don't think those are optional for Christians. I'm just, I'm just going to, I am going to stand by that. Now, the ways those, those work out in particular situations, the best ways to pursue these things, um, that is going to be a matter of, dis, of discussion. And that's why we actually need to have those conversations because we need people with particular expertise in the areas that we're, that we're talking about to help us make those, those moves. Um, I will say as well, with respect to the justice language, somehow um, reached a place in some parts of North American culture that I've seen at least, where the very word has become a trigger to some people. They don't like the way it's being used in some circles. So it's almost become, um, it, it's almost become a, a strange term of revulsion. Like they care about justice. They're like, all right, why would we give up on a beautiful, powerful biblical concept and even word? Okay, so it gets used in other ways. So what? That's not a reason to abandon it. That's a, that's a reason to reclaim it and use it properly, which I'm, I'm not suggesting he was disagreeing with that. I just want to put that stake in the ground on that. Similarly, for that matter, and I don't care about this word because it's not a, nearly as much of a biblical word, but somehow the term woke has, has taken on this entire, has this entire currency. Sometimes it looks to me like just a late intellectually lazy way of dismissing a bunch of stuff, just putting it all together and just dismissing it. The biblical concept of being awakened is a really powerful one, and it's an important one for the Wesleyan tradition. I mean, Wesley, I mean, you can't, you, you've heard, you've read, um, some of you have, students have outlined with all those million, ser million outlines of Wesley sermons, right? Um, you've outlined the sermon, awake thou that sleepest. This is a really powerful biblical term. Now, I'm not arguing that we should try to reclaim it per se, but I do want to caution us against um, too quick sort of appeal to a term that gets associated with a whole lot of things that may or may not go together as a way of dismissing everything we don't like all at once. And it's happened both ways, right? It happens on, on both left and right. So thank you for that, yeah. Trying to cut you off. Yeah, go you for it. No, it's fine. Either. No, let's let's get to yeah. yeah. So the good question. The good question from Zoban online. He comes to us from Liberia oh, tonight. Yeah, so it's just yeah. great to see and, and actually looking online. It's a honestly, I just it's another proud moment for WBS to look at all of our students online, many from various parts. I think we've at least have three continents represented. So he says this, and I think it's interesting thinking of it outside of the American context. How can we meaningfully confront corrupt political power with truthfulness in a system that hails subjectivism? That's a good question. I'm going to read it again. There's a lot of a lot in there. How can we meaningfully confront corrupt political power with truthfulness in a system that hails subjectivism? So thank you so much for that. And I, I love that this question comes from Liberia. Uh, I actually worked on these lectures while in Zambia uh, a few weeks ago, and and actually with the thinking in terms of obviously I've made reference to a distinctly North American cu cultural and political scene several times, but I actually tried to work on the the principles I'm addressing. Um, I wanted to affirm those in ways that are um, that that are not only equally true but also hopefully meaningful. In, in the Zambian context in which I was, where they were having very different sets of conversations about it means to be Christian in a nation and in a nation with 70, what is it, 71 uh, official languages and competing com strongly religious populations, but sometimes of competing, competing religions and in a nation in that case where they, it's officially now a Christian nation. So I was trying to th help think that helped me think through some of these issues in that context. So thank you for a, a question from an African. So meaningfully confront corrupt political power in a in a culture that's dominated by subjectivity. It's that's a huge challenge, right? And I wish I had an easy formula. I just encourage us follow the prophets 
and understand that sometimes to do so means, I mean, this is the really, everybody wants to be a prophet till they read the prophets. <laughs> it's not a nice life. I mean, the, the perks are not great. But as to God's people, that's what they do. So it's easy for me to say standing here in Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm aware that it's all too easy for me to say that to, to, to someone in Liberia. But it is a question, I, that is the, the most obvious sort of response I have is to follow the example of the prophets, but precisely and especially in the, in the way of Jesus, which is a way of always committed to the well-being of the other. So um, that's what I, uh, yeah. I have a question here. As you see. <clears throat> this touches slightly on what was asked, but so how do you navigate categories like goodness, uh, true human flourishing, the good life, and also avoid those categories falling into confirmation bias or, or and uh, also avoid them just falling into a type of uh, human moral subjectivity? since those categories are heavily, they're very heavily subjective since they have to rely on being experienced by individuals. I mean, Kierkegaard would have labeled those as subjective truths because we experience them and we have to make a moral judgment on them. So how, how would you uh, advise that those don't become victim of confirmation bias or they're not just tossed out too well? That might not be what you think or what you, your feelings lead you to think is right or good but that's just because those are your feelings. Mine are different. So human flourishing for me could be the total opposite. You could view it as evil, but for me, maybe I think that's human flourishing. How do you have a real conversation uh, where they don't just become confirmation bias? I see what I want, or it's not just left up to our feelings. Yeah, that's good. So that's a, there's a couple different contexts to, to process the question, I, which, I, which I appreciate very much. One of the contexts is the Christian ecclesial context, which is what I'm talking about in here. That's, I mean, these, this is, these, the subtitle is toward a Wesleyan, uh, uh, sorry, contributions toward a Wesleyan political theology. Now, in and outside the church, we're called to truthfulness and fidelity both ways, right? All the time. It's not an option, and so we should be, cons what we say in the community of faith should be consistent with what we say out of it. However, we shouldn't, my own view is we shouldn't expect um, people who don't share the same theological basis to um, follow our reasoning from certain theological premises to a particular moral conclusion. If they don't share the premises, they're not going to share the conclusion on that basis. Now, there may be a good way to work, argue there. There may, there are, in some cases, there are really good ways to argue there otherwise. Um, but to, 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 to speak to an issue that just as an example of an issue that, that I know is, is of interest to all of us here, um, very keen of, of some folk, um, think about arguments over the life of the unborn, right? The most vulnerable humans. Um, I think that there are there are defensible and good, um, theologically grounded arguments for, um, for the sanctity of the unborn. But notice the word term I just used, sanctity. That's a distinct, that's got, it's a religious term with distinctly theological content. However it's defined, it's going to be theological, right? And there are different versions of these arguments. There's image of God arguments, right? There's sort of these basic sanctity of life arguments. Uh, some people make sort of exegetically based arguments as such. Um, those are distinctly theologically grounded arguments to a conclusion. Those aren't the only ones. There are also, I think, good arguments uh, made that don't rely upon any distinctly Christian notions at all, even religious at all. Um, I think these get under undervalued and sort of underserved in the culture, but there's some really interesting ones out there. Uh, Alex Proust has a couple of really interesting arguments. One is Rawlsian based. I mentioned I mentioned the philosophy of John Rawls earlier. Uh, Rawls's view, I mean, there's a lot to it, of course, but the the relevant part for our purposes is justice is fairness. So again, if you're in the quote unquote original position or behind the so-called veil of ignorance, you can't uh, you you can see like it's it's as if you can see a culture and a whole societal setup, but you don't know where you're in it. So just on the basis of, of self-interest, if you 
you don't know if you're the factory worker or the factory owner. You want things set up in such a way that if you turn out to be the factory worker, you're not being a you know working in 14 hours a day for 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 pittance in unsafe conditions, right? You also maybe want it to be that if you're the factory owner, you put more at risk, you deserve more, right? You, but you, you don't want, you want it no matter which place you're in, you know, you want it to be, right? Now, take that sort of thing at like, like Alex Proust does and say, you can run a Rawlsian based argument for the sanctity or for the, for the pr protection of unborn human life. If you're behind the in behind the veil of ignorance and you don't know if you're in the womb or without, I mean you can see how it goes, right? Now he he makes it really clear up front. He says, I'm not a Rawlsian. I mean, he's a toneless natural law guy. He doesn't take a Rawlsian view of justice as the sort of right way to think about it. But he said he recognizes that many people in our culture find that sort of notion intuitive. And so he's appealing to them to try to move them to the same endpoint on the actual issue. So there may be four, four good roads to the right conclusion. Some of those people aren't gonna access certain of those roads because they don't have the same commitments to get them to the starting place. But that doesn't mean we're, that's the only thing we have. So I mean, I actually think that in, in those cases, if you only have the sort of theologically based arguments, well, that means that perhaps it means someone has to be a Christian or at least a kind of theist to come to the right view. Turns out those aren't the only arguments we have. And so I think in, in these cases, yes, to your question, uh, intuitions are inescapable. And I don't think that's a bad thing personally. Um, but a, but they don't, a discussion of intuitions doesn't have to resort to mere subjectivity. And even if it does, there are ways of making a positive case. Uh, sometimes they just requires to be a bit more creative. Yeah, so very good, tidy response there. Okay. Uh, I want to give folks a chance for professors to go to their classrooms and for those who are, or go even electronically. And if you're okay, we can stay in there 10 minutes. And anybody who wants to stay on, there was two other questions online um, that I'd love to get to. So if you're online, feel free to make your way out. Or if you're in the room, thank you guys thank for you. heading out. Thank yeah, let's give uh, Dr. McCall a hand. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Here's, here's a question that is connected to a lot of what our students, and I know your students at Asbury are also thinking about. Uh, when the discourse in the church itself lacks justice, how do they teach their members to reflect it in their daily lives? Look at the Methodist Church, United Methodist Church's actions for those churches seeking to leave on theological grounds to the Global Methodist Church. Is paying a percentage of church property value justice? Does this not show we are not doing what we seem to teach? Um, I could connected to the last question as well there, but I'm glad to. Do, do, do you want me to read that again? I think, I, I think I'm that. okay. Yeah. I think I got the gist of it at least. So, again, thank you for that. So, um, when discourse in the church itself lacks justice, then how do we reflect it? And how do we? So, this is so it's, yeah. So, it's bad enough to try to live as people committed to justice and holiness and shalom. It's bad enough in a world that's bent on, it seems hell-bent on, on wrecking all that. It's worse when it's in the church too, right? And, and there's no way around it. There is in many cases. And in many cases, it's going to take different forms, but we're still going to see the same sort of thing, right? Well, this, I don't mean this to sound too simplistic, but I, I, it is where I want to start is that we're going to talk about this a bit more tomorrow evening how the life of following Jesus is a life of cruciformity. So preview of coming attractions. Holiness lived out is effectively Christ-likeness. And Christ-likeness includes cruciformity. Includes more than that, but includes, un, I mean, irreducible cruciformity. And we are told by our Lord, and we are told again and again throughout the New Testament, Peter and Paul, that we should expect to suffer for doing right. I, I've been in places in other parts of the world, for instance, in uh, mainland China, where those are sort of like life verses for people. We don't hear those in many American churches. 
and it's like it's a it's foreign to us like we don't like how could we ever like this can't happen if i do the right thing it's supposed to, it's supposed to turn out right right and so i again i just will we'll talk about the general themes tomorrow night but at this point i just want to say i think we should expect again what we said about sin we shouldn't we should never be okay with it in the church but we should probably not be that surprised by it in the church and secondly as Christ suffered for our sins, and the followers of Christ are likely to suffer for sin as well. Not in the same way he did, right? Taking away the sin of the world. But the life of, he tells us the, the life of discipleship is a life of cruciformity. So thank you. Anybody else in the room? Like to respond? I have a question, and then I have one more online. With a groundswell of, oppos with a groundswell of opposition, to unjust leaders in denominational Christianity that was vigorous and vocal uh, be a negation of cruciformity to try to bring about justice for struggling and suffering churches? Would it be? It might be. I'm not going to say it would be. I'm saying it could turn into that. I mean, I could easily see, unfortunately, I mean, it's not, it doesn't, I don't have a great imagination, but even I could imagine cases where it could turn into that. Would it necessarily, like, would it as, like sort of essentially be that, like in virtue of being a protest? No, I don't think so at all. I mean, no, no more so than the prophets calling both God's enemies, or the enemies of God's people, right, in the Old Testament, and God's called people to repentance um, is in any way a violation of that. No, I mean, it, it's, there's, they sort of, um, looks like Dr. Boyd left. Maybe this is good. Because <laughs> this, this, what I'm going to say has a lot of hermeneutical uh, baggage to it, right? A lot of hermeneutics built in this assumption. I think in some ways the prophets directly in this way prefigure Christ. They speak truth and they suffer for it. They speak truth for the good of the people when it's, when the people don't want to hear it and they suffer for it. And I think that's the, 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 the prophets who prefigure Christ, Christ promises it's going to happen to the followers that, that come after him. And boy, it sounds glib to say it up here, doesn't it? But I, I do think that we shouldn't be surprised either. In fact, not only should we not be surprised, we should probably expect it. And, and there's nothing um, obvious, like there's nothing necessarily uh, opposed to cruciformity in that. But doing that may may take us to a place where the cruciformity is really obvious. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? Where the cruciformity would be really obvious? Well, if we protest certain things within the church, we may pay a price for it. Yeah. I mean, the easy, well, come on. You, it often happens, right? So if there are unjust practices and unjust leadership within, like, just frankly, sin, sinful activities with, uh, within a hierarchy of a church, and you cross that, you're very likely going to pay for it. I mean, that just happens again and again. I don't think that's a big surprise to any of us in the current context, but it, the thing, what I'm trying to say is it shouldn't be a surprise to us theologically. The surprising thing is maybe that we're still surprised by it. Yeah. I, yeah, no, Dr. No, Ayers had, gotcha. yeah. Thanks, Dr. McCall. Um, you made the statement earlier that I really loved about we should be cautious about big anything. Yeah. Right, uh, big government. Uh, big business what about big church ah good question um well i don't i mean i don't have like a cutoff like you know at a certain point like no this church is big now it's so big it's sinful no not at all i just don't have i don't know but i do think there are dangers that are for, that are probably particularly keen in larger churches and i will say this um, the Lord knows better than to make me a large church pastor. I actually mean that. I mean, it's not not we're in any danger of that or anything. Um, it's never like come close to happening. But I, I I worry like my like I would worry about myself. Not that you ever plan to be corrupted by power, but I've I've just seen it enough. So the church itself, I don't know, but leadership within the church, yeah. Again, nothing necessary about it, but it's definitely a danger. Yeah. 
Uh, Nate Clark is from Murphy, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and also a custom furniture designer who you can find at nateclark.com. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't help, my, couldn't help myself. I do have a nice piece in my kitchen from him, though, I will say. Uh, the critical here's a, here's a good question. The critical theory language of oppressed versus oppressors has some baggage today, too. Can Christians reclaim this view of justice through advocacy and agency as we might imagine God would vindicate the oppressed and punish the oppressors? I don't know why we couldn't. In fact, I hate to give it up. I mean, the concepts are at least biblical. Here, I mean, this is this is a broader, right, broader sort of Christianity and culture kind of question, right? Is the fact that something gets picked up, run with, run the wrong way with in some cases, run off the cliff with in some cases, or whatever, used in certain ways. Therefore, it's like it's a that makes it unusable, or I'm still just not willing to give up on on all that all the time that way. So that's just me. I, I'm not gonna you know, maybe. That's a prudential, that's probably a prudential matter too. But but the concept certainly we have to keep. I mean, there, I mean, I mean, I don't know how we read, I don't know how we read scripture without without the conceptual framework that there are now the, the frightening part, uh, or the doubly frightening part is um Steve, Dr. Billy Gore mentioned earlier, um, he was trying to underscore what I said about the deceitfulness of sin. And there's a literature on this in, from social psychology. Uh, you know how, at, um, well, apart from the social psychology, there's Garrison Keillor, right? <laughs> you know, all you know, all the kids are above average kind of thing, right? But this is, people have found this stuff out, like even like, all right, so at the, at the level of mostly silliness, the average American male driver is very sure that he's way better than the average. <laughs> right? True. We're all better, right? All right, but then that we take that, that's funny there. It's not so funny when we're all sure we're more moral than everyone else. And you couple that with this other thing that, that is pretty obvious in some of this literature too. And that is this, what's sometimes called moral self-licensing. So if I'm good, I can take a few moral breaks. And the, you put those together now. Since I'm better than most everyone i mean there's a few people who are better than, than me right mother Teresa was probably better whatever but no we're, we don't all think we're the best we just think we're better than and if i'm enough better than then i i i can get away with a few things it doesn't really matter well you start combining those things so i mean and this is things that people in social psychology are seeing and christians shouldn't be surprised by that christians have had a reason to 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 have already seen that for a long time. And sin, so sin has this sort of double blinding effect. It blinds us, but it blinds us with the fact that we're blind. So we're, it, it, uh, it occludes our vision, but then we think we're the only ones who see things well. It's, it's just a stunning thing morally, like everyone's sure. So, I mean, a bunch of people who on one hand, out of one side of their mouth in certain conversations will be moral anti-realists. No, there are no absolutes. Everything's relative. And yeah, in other contexts, are the most fired up and passionate about justice, right. right? And is it is it coherent? Doesn't look like it, but it doesn't keep people from from being sure about it, right? Um, and that in that sort of situation, uh, here's where I think people like Tim Keller give good advice. One can either sort of make fun of the inconsistency. Or one can try to appeal to the fact that they really are, when it comes right down to it, really do have commitments that can only be secured by moral realism. And then appeal to that and move them forward. And to me, that seems like a much actually more practical, like practicable, but also more just Christ-like way to do it. Yeah. That's great. I was reminded, um, it's encouraging to me for you to talk about the biblical language. Um, I was one time I was having a conversation with Dr. Kinlaw. I feel like we all try have those stories. And I was like, well, Dr. Kinlaw, what do you think of like this language? Sanctification, holiness. It's like, do we need to find something else? And he poked me right in the chest and he hit and two hits. I remember boom, boom. He said, don't give up the biblical language. <laughs> like it was pretty good. Um, Elijah, would you close us in prayer here? Let's pray together.
Father, we thank you that you are a God who has extended yourself to us in covenant faithfulness and holy love, Lord, that you have allowed us to see and experience and come to understand at some level the depths of your being and your character. And Lord, as we have understood that more and more, primarily through your son Jesus coming to us and transforming us, Lord, we ask that you'd help us to turn around and be able to be a transformative presence in the world around us. I want to pray for the, the many students We've gathered here tonight from all over the world. I pray your blessing on them in their context, Lord, whether that's here in the States or in another country, Lord, that you would bless them, give them wisdom on how to be a redemptive, a salt and light presence in their community. And Lord, as we continue to think on these concepts across the next few days, we ask that your Holy Spirit would illuminate our minds, would drive us forward closer to, uh, Lord, your will for this world and your kingdom coming in more powerful ways. So we submit ourselves to you, ask that you continue to lead us and guide us. And we thank you for welcoming us into your family and shaping us even here tonight through Dr. McCall's teaching. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.